uh, Capital Strategies for the Arts series uh, from the Maryland State Arts Council. We're really thrilled to have everybody here and um, with all the positive response we've had from this series so far. I'm Ryan Patterson, the Arts Capital Program Coordinator uh, for the Maryland State Arts Council, and I'm uh, uh, managing the new Arts Capital Grant. And we've put together this series to just give some kind of uh, great uh, voices from the field um, connected to you all and um, offer kind of primer, um, a primer and, and basic understanding of some of the, the considerations that go into planning capital projects. I am thrilled to have Andrew Chavez here from uh, Brailsford and Dunleavy and um, a representative as well of uh, um, the board of Baltimore Office of Promotion in the Arts. So um, I'm gonna go through some of our grounding slides the Maryland State Arts Council does at the start of every uh, webinar. And then I will turn it over to Andrew and get you all the information you came to hear. Feel free to uh, use the chat to introduce yourself or say hi to one another as we go, but um, we're gonna get started. So just to get started, we're on Google Meet today. You are likely familiar with this platform if you attend a lot of Maryland State Arts Council's info sessions, but just keep in mind that it'd be great if you could keep your microphone on mute as we go through the presentation. And um, you can turn your video on or off. We're happy either way. If you hit the red phone icon, it will hang you up or leave the meeting. And uh, if that happens, you'll just have to rejoin. It's no big deal, but uh, sometimes we hit it on accident. You should be aware of that. Over to the right-hand corner, uh, you'll find a little word bubble that'll let you access the chat. The people icon lets you see the other people in this meeting. And uh, we will actually be using some interactive polls today. So this should kind of pop up over on the side as we go. I'm gonna start with our uh, land acknowledgement statement which is based on Maryland State Arts Council's work with the native people of Maryland. Uh, you can find out more about this through our website and I will drop the link after I read this aloud. We acknowledge the lands and waters now known as Maryland are the home of its first peoples, the Akahonic Indian tribe, Assateague People's tribe, the Cedar Cedarville Band of Piscataway Indians, the Choptico Band of Indians, the Lenape tribe, the Nanticoke tribe, the Nase Waywash Band of Indians, Piscataway Kanoi Tribe, Piscataway Indian Nation, Pocomoke Indian Nation, Susquehannock Indians, Yagahaney River Band of Shawnee, and tribes in the Chesapeake watershed who have seemingly vanished since the coming of colonialism. We acknowledge that this land is now home to other people living here in diaspora. We acknowledge that the forced removal of many from the lands and waterways that have nurtured them as kin. We acknowledge the degradation that continues to be wrought on the land and waterways in pursuit of resources. We acknowledge the right of the land and waterways to heal so that they can continue to provide food and medicine for all. We acknowledge that it is our collective obligation to pursue policies and practices that respect the land and waters so that our reciprocal relationship with them can be fully restored. Our equity and justice statement is that the arts celebrate our state's diversity, connect our shared humanity, and transform individuals and communities. The Maryland State Arts Council and its supporting collaborators are committed to advancing and modeling equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in all aspects of our organizations and across the communities of our state. Maryland State Arts Council and its grantees are committed to embracing equity and non-discrimination, regardless of race, religious creed, color, age, gender, expression, sexual orientation, class, language, and or ability. And our vision is that the Maryland State Arts Council plays an essential role in ensuring every person has access to the transformative power of the arts. And our mission is that we advance the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all the people of Maryland. Uh, in 2019, we went under, we undertook a strategic planning process that came up with the five following goals that I will read aloud now. Increase participation, provide intentional support, build capacity, leverage connections, and bolster Maryland arts. And we like to begin every meeting with uh, reading aloud our creative meeting actions. I invite you to unmute and just read one of these uh, sentences in full. Don't 
worry about stepping on each other's toes. Let's just uh, take turns going around. Whoever wants to go first, kick us off. Celebrate being in the space with other creative people. Engage with everyone's presence as a gift. Acknowledge that together we know a lot. Enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry. Share your idea and trust that it will be heard. Use I statements. Don Lamb Minor, the Annapolis Arts District. Focus your language on the task at hand. Hold one another accountable with care. Apply yes and I hear your idea and I'm going to add to it. Balance speaking and listening. Thank you all. That was great. So two more slides, a couple more slides from me. So uh, um, we offer professional development opportunities throughout the year. Um, these cover a range of topics, but we also welcome you to offer your own topics to us. Um, you can find any of our upcoming sessions through MSAC's Eventbrite, the same platform you probably use to register for today's session. I just put the link to that page in the chat. Uh, but we also welcome you to send in your suggestions or ideas. We'd love to hear the kind of information that you're looking for and figure out how we can provide it. And there's other ways to get involved. You can find this under MSAC about slash ways to get involved. Um, we offer opportunities for the public to contribute as editors and panelists to all of our programs. So editors help revise the policies and um, and the uh, grant guidelines for each program. And that happens occasionally and annually. We have lots of opportunities for people to serve as panelists. It's a great way to get a kind of behind the scenes look at how our grant programs work and um, contribute uh, your, your um, time to helping to score uh, applications. Um, you are also paid for both of those opportunities. If you have any questions, reach out to program directors for each of those. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, with all that um, um, said, I am happy to, again, introduce Andrew, and I will um, stop sharing my screen and let you give your presentation, Andrew. Uh, yeah, just absolutely. a little bit of housekeeping. I think people can put questions in the chat as we go, and there'll be some opportunity for Q&A, but um, I, I will be here to address uh, any questions that come up in the chat. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan, for having me. Thanks to MSAC, and thank you to you all for being here. It's a little bit cloudy here in Baltimore, but we had some amazing days of weather. So I'm grateful for that. Let me pull up my screen and we'll get this going. Yeah. I swear Ryan and I practice this, so we're good. You're doing great. I won't rest. <laughs> awesome. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Great. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Andrew Chavis, and I am very excited to get into the topic of the triple constraint today, kind of breaking down what that means and how you can actually put that into practice as you kind of consider your projects moving forward. A little bit about me, uh, I'm a resident of Baltimore City and live here with my wife and our Greyhound, Penny, who's doing the, the Tulip Report at Sherwood Gardens recently, which was great. Uh, background is that I have over a dozen years of experience, both as a project manager for a large construction company and as an architect here in the city of Baltimore, registered architect in the state of Maryland, but currently merged those backgrounds to be a senior project manager at Brailsford and Dunleavy, 
which I'll share a little bit more on next. Uh, history, studied and worked in Philadelphia, which was kind of where I fell in love with, with cities in general, kind of sharpened my, my ax a little bit working in DC for a while, but I had a friend who was going to MICA and said, you need to check out Baltimore. And we did in 2015 and have never left. So really love it here. The last piece and why I'm most excited to be here today is that I am a believer in all of the work that you all are doing to kind of advance culture and arts in our state. I'm a huge believer that art isn't just something that, that we enjoy, but it's what drives our communities forward. It's what it creates an economic engine for our neighborhoods. And so I'm kind of portraying that by currently serving as the interim board for Baltimore Office of Promotion of the Arts, which I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do and to share that passion with you all today. A little bit about Brailsford and Dunlavey. b and is a minority-owned business founded in 1993, so celebrating 30 years. They have over 150 on staff, various backgrounds, seven offices nationwide, but based in DC, so very familiar with working throughout the state of Maryland and in DC. And they have a great mission which is kind of summarized here, but I think the three words inspire, empower, and advance is what's at the core of everything that we do when it comes to projects. And we deliver that both from a very early planning stage all the way through implementation and then even into management. So obviously this is this is less a sales pitch for us and just an out, outburst of our passion for, for sharing information again, to kind of inspire, empower, and advance you all in the work you're doing. So enough about me, I wanted to learn a little bit about you. And this is where we're going to do our polls a little bit. So Ryan's gonna help me out with this. And what I wanted to try to understand from everyone that's here is what capital investment would help your organization achieve its mission? And we've kind of broken it down into three categories, furniture, design prep, hiring an architect, or facility improvements, actual construction, or maybe you don't know, and you're just kind of here to figure that out. So I wanted to gauge the crowd a little bit. So we'll give you a minute to fill that out. And Ryan, if you don't mind sharing the results. Sure, I think I have to end the poll to share the results, so. Sure, um, yeah, we'll give everyone a minute. A minute. Two votes so far. Does this pop up for you all? We haven't tried this this fun uh, tool yet. This is Jim. Turning. It's not popping up for me to do the poll. Huh. Yeah. Okay. This is Chris. I don't see I the poll either. either. No, bummer. <laughs> and, uh, I have to go into the like these little activities button and if you click on that then there's a thing for polls i don't know okay show up right away. yeah if you click that triangle square circle activities next to the chat icon it should pop up i think i got it now thank you great thank you perfect awesome Thanks for helping us work through it just testing the limits of the tool right ryan that's the goal yeah all right so we got seven votes give it a few more 10 votes All right, ready? 11. Okay, I'm gonna edit. There we go. Do you all see that? No? Andrew, can you see it? We can see it. I, I cannot, no. But if you don't mind sharing them, if you have them. Um, so you have, uh, most people want are, are interested in facility improvement. Uh, there's that's six votes. There's three under not sure two under FF and E and one under design prep. Okay, great. So not the big projects. Awesome. No, that's super helpful. And yes, I think we would all agree that, that a new building or improvement or a space would definitely help us all achieve what we're where we're going missionally. So that's great feedback though. Good to know that we're a little bit, everyone's interested a little bit in something. So that's that's huge. So walking through the goals for today, it's, it's listed here, but I think really fundamentally, it's understanding what are the principles, what is the framework in order to help make sure that we're in the right mindset 
when we're trying to develop and deliver um, projects. Three. So key questions help with that. Understanding some tools that can sort of walk you through it is the next stage. And lastly, I think just coming out today excited for the journey ahead and excited for what this program can offer. It's it's a huge opportunity to help further your mission that, that MSAC's providing. And so we're excited to be a part of it. So that gets to the fancy title, right? What is the triple constraint? It is it is a good phrase that was developed in the 1950s. And much like the modern art movement in the 50s, it was sort of looking at simplifying simplifying things to basic elements and representing them. So it essentially took projects and reduced them to, to three features, which is scope, time, and cost. It's a catchy phrase. I like it. But like, like most things in the 1950s and most policies, they weren't perfect. They didn't consider everything, and they needed to evolve over time, right? So. The theory is not perfect. The triple constraint is not really a triple. There are so many other variables that go into projects, and they've only become more complex over time, really, as, as we have existential crises and issues of teamwork and regulations that begin to really play into what we need to do. However, what we want to do, again, is just a fundamental understanding. So this might be familiar to everyone, but we'll just do a quick press course on what is the triple constraint, why are these three things important, and how do they ultimately result to quality, which is what we're all going for. This is some basic definitions of each of those constraints, time just being the actual time to do it, scope being a very, and I'll say specific, and I'll underline that specific requirements that are achieved, and cost is what are the resources. That might be money, it could be bartering, it could be loans. We'll get into some of these topics today, but understanding that all of these are kind of intrinsically related to one another and are dependent on each other. So let's let's walk through a theoretical project and see how these, these three different options interact with one another, right? We'll use building a sandcastle as kind of the template for understanding these three different items. And if you thought of an ideal sandcastle, it might look something like this, right? It's got a couple tiers, it's, it's a little moat ready, it has a flag on top, there's some seashell decorations. It's, it's a good ideal sandcastle that we'd all hope to expect and see at the beach. Now, if, if your parents called you in early from the beach and you don't have as much time to complete the sandcastle because a storm's coming, that's gonna impact the quality of the sandcastle. And if you can't afford the seashells to decorate because your friend wanted five lollipops instead of two in exchange, that's gonna impact the cost and your ability to purchase the materials for this. So what that ends up doing is essentially reduces the quality and you end up with a lesser quality product while the scope, build a sandcastle, still remains the same. On the opposite end, you have greater quality, which say you make friends with an architect at the beach and the architect has this great idea for this awesome looking sandcastle, but it's gonna take four times as long on the beach to actually make it and you need to buy some really fancy and specific tools to get the angles just right. You'll end up with a great looking sandcastle, one that's photo ready, but you're, you've spent more than your ideal and you spent more time than your ideal, which has given you greater quality, but again, is deviated from the ideal. What we like to, to kind of preach is that successful projects have a clear vision for their ideal. It's organizations, that know exactly what their mission is and understand how their scope, their costs, and their time lead to this ideal quality. So we'll do another quick poll, just kind of information gathering. Again, it's a fundamental flash of, of those three, but we're gonna try another poll again and understand of these three, which ones are you most excited to explore as you kind of consider your projects moving forward. And we'll give a minute to get that figured out.
Ryan, okay. the second okay. poll is oh, okay. I hadn't gotten the pop up yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, they're getting good at this. All right, we have votes coming in. Love it. Scope Just is in the lead. Scope and cost are right on top of each other, time less so. Got it. All right, going to end it with 12 votes. It looks like we have uh, six for cost, five for scope, and one for time. Okay, got it. Great. Well, we'll go over each of those, and unfortunately, there's a lot of great resources to help walk through all of those. So, awesome. Thanks, everyone, for participating. That's huge and very helpful in, like, shaping and knowing where, where we all are collectively, right? So let's dive into scope first, since that was, was the good one. So scope... Again, just a description of underlining specific requirements that achieve the end result. And something that we like to advise when considering scope is to really start with your with your why. And this that is a direct phrase from this book by Simon Sinek, which I encourage anyone to at least watch the TED Talk for the first the first 15 minutes. Maybe there's just some really great thinking about organizations and how we usually start with the what of our projects instead of starting with the why of our projects, sort of as a, as a gut reaction. You know, nonprofit organizations, they're strapped, they're trying to get their program moving along, there's so much going on and you're very taxed, but it's always important to take a break and start with that why. The reason that that is important is that it's, it's one of the areas where you have the most control over those three different subjects, right? We can't necessarily control cost or time because they're outside, but defining the scope is what we can do and we have the most control over. So here is some steps on steps to take that are kind of recommendations on how you might develop your project scope. I think first of all is we might have a mission statement that's trying to address a problem and within that, we have objectives, we have a strategic plan, potentially. So what is it that you're using to identify the problem? What is the challenge that your organization's facing or that's a blockade for achieving your mission? And how does that become project scope? I think it's always good to turn that into a statement similar to, to your own organization's mission statement. The project gets its own mission statement so that we're all clear on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. The next step is to what's called acceptance criteria. So really, what are the list of things that are going to make this successful? If X were to happen as a result, what would that be? Uh, also thinking about what are the, do we know the physical qualities, the physical characteristics? Does it need to have does it need to have an auditorium or does it need to be made of durable materials? Will it be sitting outside? Understanding what, what is acceptable to make it successful helps us to flush out the scope and that mission. And lastly, in the next step is a list of deliverables. Deliverables being what are the things that will result from the mission that is defined by the acceptance criteria, right? So it could be, in the case of furniture, it's new office furniture. In the case of a building, it's a, a new stadium for art performances, or it might just be renovating a gallery to get new lighting. Those are kind of the, the ways that you develop a list of deliverables, which will inform your scope. And those first four steps Again, we'll kind of get into time and, and what that duration is later. But those four, again, this is where the owner gets to kind of take control and, and develop a document that can be used to kind of guide the project forward. Step five is, is understanding known constraints. If you know of a deadline that you need to hit, sometimes that is tied to funding. Sometimes that's tied to your own, your own mission and your own purpose. 
or outside events, and then cost. So those, again, you see the two other, the two other edges of that triangle pop up to help flush out this entire project. And the last step, which I don't want to, to miss, is this kind of feedback consensus approval loop. So sometimes we can get focused in our track and we forget to reach out to our stakeholder groups and, and maybe we don't make time in our development of this to get buy-in from everyone that we need to to make sure that we all feel comfortable and good so when this is complete we have we have a successful project but i would recommend a little more detail and this is kind of the msac resource is that the 320 session that ann powell gave on how to decide where to begin gets a lot more into detail into project scope and how you can actually start to document those things we're not going to dive into that detail here today but would recommend checking that out So jumping onto cost. So these are the resources required to obtain the work products required to complete the project. So a lot of times this is capital, right? This is cash, this is money in the bank um, to help pay people to do, to accomplish the project or get the things that we need done. So some key steps to develop the project cost is again, we made, we made that scope deliverables in the last step as we we're developing the scope. And the goal is to assign each of those an actual budget amount. Now, a lot of the a lot of times we have no idea, we're guessing, but there are definitely ways that we can focus and narrow our understanding of cost, which is easy as Googling things online, uh, talking to peer institutions that have potentially done similar projects to get their input and data. And then also just going out to the industry, calling up a furniture vendor calling up a contractor and asking for a rough order of magnitude based on that scope deliverables sometimes this is something that people are willing to to participate in because for them it's a business development opportunity to provide pricing but again this is the goal is just that each of your deliverables kind of starts to get a budget amount that we can begin to understand another important step is understanding soft costs versus hard costs and that's also kind of a timing conversation soft costs are the the things that you can't touch that are required it's it's design fees it's development fees you're gonna have to pay a lot of different people for more complex projects to get that in place but don't result in a thing hard costs are the actual thing and so when we're planning, we, we also not only want to understand the exact scope deliverable, but begin to categorize those buckets. And then the last step is to, to list out funding sources. So you have this, you have your calculated total sum. This is what it's gonna cost for all these deliverables. Where's the funding gonna come from so that we know that we can afford it. And on the right are a list of a bunch of sources that have helped nonprofits in the past. And again, another resource, the last session that happened, Real Estate Development for Good by CapEx, was a, was a really great summary of cost and project development and understanding some of these funding sources. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. The one that we are gonna jump into a little bit more is time. Just understanding what is the, the project duration from start to finish. So, while we got our mighty time people who voted out there, I think this will still help to kind of flush out, uh, flush out the whole, the whole process for us. So, as you know, and as you've probably heard, projects for design and construction are complicated. They have multiple variables that, again, are changed based on scale and complexity. Those are big drivers of, of what makes projects more complicated. If, if you just want to paint a room in your office, that's a small scale and not very complex. If you want to build a new performing arts venue, that is a large scale and very complex. So that's one framework to kind of start to understand time. What we use is something called the critical path method scheduling, which is, is a framework it's a trellis is the word I like to use to, 
make sense out of that complexity and scale. It gives us sequenced events that we'll start to see on the next page in a simplified form. Um, so the examples that I'm going to share try to capture a little bit of that complexity and how we try to simplify it when planning projects. So let's take a sample project. Let's say we want to order some new furniture. What we've listed out is, for me, it's, these are the keys to success for a project like this is, again, understanding our scope that's been established through the past processes that we reviewed, understanding our budget, that's known. Because when you go to a furniture vendor, or even if you start to shop online, you need to know what do I want exactly and what is my budget exactly. And that kind of protects the organization and also protects the project to have that defined. The last piece, again, varies for complexity for what you're trying to do. If you're trying to furnish a whole new office, that might be different than trying to buy a couple new chairs in terms of how much stakeholder input you need. But this schedule starts to again look at the critical path method of what are the things that we need to do in order to lead to success for our projects and what are the milestones that we need to achieve to get through that i'll walk through it kind of in summary and then at the end if we want to go back and ask questions i think that would be great so the first step that you'll see on any of these is to develop scope and a request for proposal so we always recommend Kind of regardless of the scale that having a formal document that not only shows our formality and our desire for this to be successful but it also makes sure that when we're going out and asking people to give a price that it's the same we're asking the same thing to every person that we talk to next you'll hand out that proposal you get numbers back we want to confirm that those numbers are good and that it actually includes everything and then we want to approve that contract to get it moving forward. That's our milestone, the order's placed, and the lowest qualified bidder is a term that we use where, again, going back to the, the, the triangle, just because it's the cheapest doesn't mean it's necessarily the most qualified or the best. So again, we're, our target is the ideal. Manufacturing delivering can occur for furniture. This could be it could be one week or overnight if it's through Amazon, or it could be up to 12 weeks if it's more complicated. And then finally installing that furniture. So as you can see, even something as simple as furniture could be a very quick process, or it could be a, a long process, but this is the recommendation that we would make based on kind of the variables. Here are some key questions that we like to use when soliciting for furniture. And again, Ryan, we're going to share this, right? So I won't go through. We are. These. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I just want to make sure I don't need to take time for people to understand or, or take a peek. But I think, again, the quality is important, understanding the scale of the vendor, understanding miscellaneous charges like installation charge, freight charge, hauling the trash away sometimes is even a charge. For this group, I think it's always important to ask if they offer nonprofit pricing or if they participate in nonprofit programs. Those do exist and they are very beneficial. How are they going to review the order with your organization? And then lastly, what are the logistics? The building that you're in, can they accept large deliveries? Do they need to be at a certain time? Those are kind of the things that you want to ask when developing this schedule to make sure you're aware of the outcome. So hopping on to design prep and planning, which is one that there was definitely some interest in. This project process, which is really hiring a designer, in this case, an architect or an engineer to help complete your project. Again, you still want to know what your scope is. It, it may not be as detailed from what we call programming conception in terms of what are the actual square foots, what's the actual rooms but we have a general idea of what it is we're trying to accomplish. Again, budget is key so that we're giving some instruction on, on what our target is and what our ideal is. And the last point, which is a little bit shifted from the furniture, right, is understanding that 
there's going to be a feedback loop. Designers are going to create documents, and they're going to want to get a reaction to those documents. For the organization, we want to make sure we have key stakeholders in place, a group of maybe it's one person, maybe it's a group of three people who are going to take time out of their day to meet with the design team, look at documents, give feedback, and make sure, again, that the design is proceeding in a way that meets the scope and also just aligns with the vision overall for the organization. Practically, again, it, depending on complexity, this could be a very short process or it could be a very long process depending on the complexity and, and the level of development. You can see that again, we're going out for an RFP. We want to get competitive pricing. We want to get multiple numbers. We want to interview those teams and get to understand their personality. We may want to negotiate the contract to understand exactly what's in it and to make sure that it's meeting our needs. And then once the contract is signed, that's when we get into the actual designing, which can take, which can take some time depending on the complexity. So what I do want to point out is this red star, which will kind of relate to when we get to construction. But depending on the complexity of the project, there may be a there may be an instance where the permit set will want to be issued. Sorry, will be want to be issued prior to the actual bid set going out. We'll talk on that a little bit more later. Some key questions for the design prep part for the architect when they're giving their proposals, we want to kind of understand three things plus a little more, but the three that I always look for immediately are just the outline of deliverables, what I'm actually getting, what are the drawings I'm getting, am I getting renderings, so that when I go and do my capital campaign or try to fundraise, I have pretty pictures, do we have a project schedule with actual milestones so we can all stay on track, and then clarifications and exclusions. These are the things that they either do not include that maybe we've asked for, or they're modifying what we have asked for a little bit, and they're clarifying that point. Those are very important to review. Understanding as the architect performs similar work, what's the actual fee structure for their contract? Are they requiring anything from you? Sometimes they'll need documents. If you own property, if you're renting a space, they'll want those documents so that they can understand what are, the, what are the parameters that they need. And sometimes that requires an investment from you all in order to provide them those materials. And lastly, this is more kind of a, a little more theoretical for architects, but what is their approach to programming? How do they survey? How do they collect data on your organization? And then how do they use that and put it into practice? And lastly, does the aesthetic align with your organization? Do you like how it looks? That's kind of uh, that's an important, right? We want to, at the end of the day, enjoy what what space we're walking into and how we're using it. So the last schedule we will do, which is not furniture, this is construction, a little more complicated. Which the the main keys to success here is making sure you have your capital in place. It's it's not good to tell someone go build something and not have the money to do it. And while that's that's often a Herculean lift, it's a very important part of this process. There are, again, complexity can play a role in that, but generally it's a very good idea. And then lastly, the, the owner's representative has been identified. And that's not just people like me or like Ann with Plan B or like CapEx who kind of professionally serve as owner's reps, but also internally, who is the, the representative? So maybe a lowercase r, right? Who's, who's the person that's going to be leading this project from the owner's perspective? There are decisions that will need to be made, contracts that will need to be signed, and uh, somebody needs to have the authority from the organization to do that. And that's a very important person to have in place before we jump into any project. So construction starts to get a little more complicated. There's different layers, there's more complexity. And so what this is really looking at is, is the, big, the big question I think we all have with those capital projects is getting a permit, how long is it gonna take? Always an issue, uh, always takes some effort, depending on your jurisdiction especially, but it's something we want to keep in mind. 
And what this is trying to illustrate is that the, the sequence of getting your permit needs to align with how you're getting your contractor on board. We don't want to have a permit issued and then wait for another month before we have our contractor on board. And we also don't want to get our contractor on board and then six weeks later, we don't have our permit. So it's trying to line those things up so that they kind of hit as close together as possible. But a similar sequence to hiring our design team, we want to get an RFP out, we want to get numbers to confirm scope and confirm the cost. And then lastly, the construction, which can take, again, depending on complexity, short time, long time. And that last piece here for, for larger projects that required a permit, you need a certificate of a Certificate of occupancy, that's that's your big goal. That means that the city has come in or the, the jurisdiction has come in, they've signed off and said that we're good with this, you can now use it, which leads to move in and punch list. And I don't want to underscore the punch list portion of this, which is we call punch list just understanding that there are things that may not be complete by the end of the job or there may be things that were not done according to the drawings that you all paid very good money to get done. And we want those things to, to line up. So there might be some time after the project's actually complete where we just want to hold everyone accountable to the agreements they've made and make sure they complete that punch list. So some other key questions, again, for construction is who will be managing the permit submission? Will it be the architect? Will it be the contractor? What does your jurisdiction require? Are they, are they all online or do they still do paper? Do you need to go to the city or to the town hall for anything? Uh, in terms of the RFP, again, understanding what's in the contract, what's in the agreement, asking for detailed project scope, understanding the schedule. There's that clarifications and exclusions again. And lastly, especially for construction contracts, if there's something in there you don't understand, you should ask. And I do like to say good contractors are good teachers, and they'll definitely be willing to walk you through their agreement. Again, similar work. Do they have a good reputation? Make sure they're licensed and insured to protect them and you. And then lastly, how do they communicate progress? Do they, do they plan to text you photos of update? Are they going to plan regular walkthroughs? How will they work with you and the team to make sure that you get to a successful ending. And with that, I will thank you and turn it over. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was uh, just an, a ton of really great information about how to plan and um, be efficient in, in staging our project. Um, I am opening the floor to questions now and um, kind of help moderate, but um, yeah, I'm sure people are have stuff in mind. Feel free to unmute or raise your hand and call on you. Andrew, one thought that came to mind for me, I'm sure a lot of this is, is you know, kind of, you know, there's the best practice and you can draw it and diagram it out yep. and have the best of intentions. And then there's the stuff you kind of learn on the job. What are maybe a few points, you know, you wish were maybe emphasized more when you were first learning about the triple constraint or project management principle? I mean, you know, what, what are some maybe undersaid things? Yeah, well, and I think a lot of it's Ryan, is you can, you can plan as much as you want, um, but things are gonna happen. So I, I think that what we really didn't really get into is like, how do you react when something goes wrong, right? Because something will go wrong and you do need, in some of the other presentations, they talk about contingency and so, we want to make sure that we either have money set aside for those contingencies uh, or that we just we understand what's going to happen if something goes wrong, because um, mm -hmm. more likely than not, it will. And I think, again, that's some of the complexity that that the whole triple constraint just doesn't really consider is uh, things will go wrong. So Gosh, that's, let's play. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I feel like when we see budgets, a lot of times the budget template or you know best practice will say you know a line item for contingency and there might be a rule of thumb there like five percent to twenty percent mm -hmm. you know whatever kind of values what's a good thinking around 
time contingency? Should you be budgeting in a certain amount? Is it a percentage of the overall timeline of the project? Yeah, absolutely. And so in the construction industry, they call that float time. And so again, depending on the complexity and when they give you a schedule, they might have they might have a buffer of a week total for the whole project so that if there's a rain day or something happens that they'll build in that buffer. But I think I think generally what we see is is for some of the early phases, it's like having a having a window of two weeks to kind of tack on. And I think a lot of that's just getting getting approvals, getting sign offs, making sure we're checking in with people. That takes time and it takes time to get to get answers to some of our questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me go to Chris. Chris has his hand raised and then we'll go to Allison. Hey, this is Chris. Um, uh, thanks for this presentation, Andrew and, and Ryan. Um, and I, uh, what, what you're just talking about, uh, the process of getting permits and getting this and that done can be very time consuming. But I have a question about the uh, an earlier uh, end of the process, so the, the fundraising uh, part where you're trying to find the money to do the project. What, what I've seen happen uh, with nonprofits uh, is that the money comes from different directions. Like you never really have all the money, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, I think it's sort of a fantasy that you have this capital campaign and all of a sudden you got, wow, I've got enough money to do the project. Instead, you know, the department of, you know, something or other is giving you money for led lights and the department of something else is giving you money to, you know, fix the, the, uh, sprinkler system. What, what's your perspective on how to, like corral all these different things and and maintain sanity and a, a, a timeline <laughs> yeah great question um that i think i think we're all we're all curious and still trying to trying to figure out because sometimes the regulations change on on what's required of that money right you're you're given a, you're given a piece of the pie but you need to eat it a certain way and so i think how do we plan for that is a good question and that's that's where it, what the tools that we use to manage that are kind of very early cash flow and uh what we call kind of capital resources assignments and so it's it's just an overall understanding here's here's each and every project scope here's how much that costs and here's the bucket of money that that's coming from and so having one place where you can kind of see the big picture of all of your capital in one place how that impacts time that's where it gets super complicated and it, it really depends on understanding the requirements and and the deadlines and i think chris to your point you know you get different grants for different things and so your scope changes suddenly because you're required to do something that's a, tied to that um so yeah. it's again it's ever evolving and that's where we we just need to checking in regularly and whether that's a committee on the board or or someone or an owner's rep or someone else who's helping you look at things monthly is a is a big deal yeah i think the the thank you i think the time um the time requirements on these grants uh is really challenging because uh, i think you were alluding to that when you know sometimes you have to spend the money within a year mm -hmm. You, you get into these cart before the horse situations where you know the de design isn't even done yet but you need to tell the uh the lighting the lighting guy where to put the lights uh, it's it's quite challenging thank you for your answer thanks i i saw allison did you still have a question i do um and i'm gonna have a confession here i did follow up with michael with capex from the last webinar and I painted a picture of who Art Park Project is and our trajectory is very unique and different. Um, and I'm going to ask kind of the same, is it, is it possible to follow up with B&D Incorporated? If for example, um, we're unique and it's just a huge long story and it would take up a lot of time, <laughs> but it would involve restoration, renovation, and I need a curatorial library. If there is a specific goal in construction or architecture, and I'm working in diff different ways to source the funding and supports, and I'll, it, I've got a book, I've got a collection, <laughs> I have a, you know artwork and all this sort of stuff that are different components. Barter and trade has been huge for us. I mm -hmm. highly recommend 
and our partnership. And I won't get into that. We have wonderful partnerships. So um, my question is, would your firm, that's the BND Incorporated, be available to help to source the right folks for a specific, in this example, I'll say the curatorial library that needs to be constructed and developed? Yeah, that is, that is, you got a web there, Allison. So kudos to you for managing all of that. But it's, <laughs> yes, it's, it is something that we're familiar with. I think, you know, we, again, are the advisory portion of, of our team is that early on looking at the, the pro forma to make sure that we have all the money in the right places and not, not unsurprisingly, those sources can look very different. And so again, I think it's, it's having the experience to take all that and, and work with you to kind of sort through in your head where everything at, is at, get it on paper, and then again, chart out a path forward on how that's gonna be used. And do you have, for example, referrals for folks that you think might be the best candidate for a specific task, job, construction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's where our, that's where our kind of broad network is helpful in the fact that, you know, we do we do have a larger presence, which is great, which means that we also know a lot of people, not just in Maryland, Baltimore, but throughout the area. So if they if they're coming in from central PA and they're the best ones for the job, we can have that conversation. Thank you so much. This is great news. Thank you, Allison. Thanks. Great question. Did anybody else have anything? Mind. Feel free to just unmute um, or you can also drop something in the chat. Hey, Andrew. Um, I was just going to ask like about the permitting process. Is that typically all on the owner or do we try to delegate responsibilities to the design team and the contractor as well? Yeah, great question, Rada. Um, the the permitting, so the owner the owner owns the permit, right? It is it is their permit, but it is usually delegated to either the designer or the builder. And where that gets complicated is again going back to the schedule of when we get a when do we get a permit set issued for less complicated projects that might be just the permit is done and then we can go seamlessly into construction or seamlessly hire a contractor who will do that for us. Um, for complex projects, we might have a contractor on board earlier in the process and they can submit the permit for us while we're still getting the, the rest of the documents finalized, right? Because all that complexity needs to be flushed out, but we can get enough information to get a permit submitted. And it's at that point, if we have a contractor engage that early, great, they can do it. If not, the architect will do it, but we will need a contractor on board to actually pull the permit. Most jurisdictions are now going to, you need to have a contractor's name specifically, they're picking it up before they will actually issue the permit to start construction. And that goes back to insurance and all these other things, but. Good question. Thanks. Great stuff so far. We have about five minutes left. And um, again, feel free to just unmute or uh, raise your hand if you have a question. I am going to take a minute here to plug. Um, in two weeks, we will have our final and fourth session, which is going to be kind of more of a less of a presentation and more of just an ask a contractor, ask a building consultant format. So. Think about what you want to know for your upcoming projects. And we have people here to talk about um, design, construction, engineering, and energy issues. So that should be pretty fun. Um, and feel free to, to think ahead about what you want to ask there. Also, we are actively working on trying to tune up and revise the um, grant guidelines for the arts capital program so that we can reopen the grant in June for the FY25 cycle. So um, anybody interested in that, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm probably gonna say, um, I can't give the details until the guidelines are published, <laughs> but um, if you had any big questions about what was not clear or areas you think we could improve, I'd love to hear that. 
but okay, I'll stop talking. Stephanie, do you have a question? I just wanted to ask if I don't want to say we're not going to get funding in that first round, but if we didn't, <laughs> could we apply for that June round? Yeah, that's an okay. excellent question. So here's the 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 idea this timing is we will be we are wrapping up our review. I know it's been sort of slow, we've been re moving cautiously, slowly with the first review of the FY24 grants. We'll be wrapping that up in May. I should let everybody who applied know whether you're gonna be proceeding forward with funding, and then we'll probably need to work through maybe additional documentation, review, et cetera. You'll be on that path if you are recommended to receive funding. If you were not recommended to receive funding, I will be able to give you some notes and guidance to reapply this summer for FY25. Awesome, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, hey, anything else before we wrap up today? All right, well, I just thank you all for being here. Um, I think Andrew, this was awesome and really appreciate the level of detail we got into. I think these have been just successively building on each other and the network we're growing um, has been awesome. I, I so appreciate you um, referencing back to our prior panelists and mm -hmm. kind of build offering today. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in and who will be tuning in virtually after this is posted online. Great, yes, thank you all. This was great and excited for, for what this will bring for our arts community. Thank you. All right. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>